Um, uh, okay, thank you for staying. And um, I'm going to be presenting about uh, APIs and language processing, uh, specifically in Twitter using Python. And this has a lot of things to do with the previous talk as well, because uh, the reason I'm presenting about this is la this summer I worked as a data science research intern in the computational economics uh, lab at Ecole Polytechnique. So here, here's where I worked. And so a brief outline about the presentation. I'm going to be first talking a little bit about me and why I'm interested in this topic, why you should be interested in this topic. Then I'm going to be moving on with API streaming using Tweepy, which is a library in Python to deal with the Twitter API. Next, I'll be talking about what geolocating data means and how you can do that using Carmen, another Python library. And once you have this data and this geolocation, how you would possibly want to represent this data using R. And lastly, I'll be talking about some introductory language processing using TextBlob. And if there's some time, I'll um, entertain some questions and answers. So right now, I am a second year student within the bachelor program at Ecole Polytechnique, and I'm following a mathematics and computer science uh, double major. In uh, CS, I'm very interested in the interactions between humans and technologies, primarily through language. Um, and if you want, you can follow my work on GitHub and LinkedIn. So you have my um, usernames there and the QR code as well. So this past summer, what I had done was uh, specifically worked with Twitter data to analyze how social movements like Me Too and Gilets Jean lead to actual legislative changes. So to do this, I'd have to localize the data. So if I was getting um, data from Paris, I could see how that would lead to changes in Paris itself. In order to localize this data, you'd have to control for Twitter concentrations. This means to recognize how many people use Twitter in these areas. For example, if you take a small village in France, maybe not a lot of people use Twitter there. So it may not be useful to actually see the impact of these social movements because they won't be related. If any change does come, up, come about, it would be irrespective of this um, uh, social movement. So to do this, I had to interact with the Twitter API and generate uh, concentrations based on region and time period. Um, OK, so now I'm going to be talking about why you should be interested in dealing with things like this. The world's largest database that is updated with the highest amount of frequency is well, social media. Uh, in specific, if you talk about Twitter, you see real-time updates on what people think about any given topic at any given time. So if you want to talk about the Amazon fires or the Hong Kong protests or anything, you'd, social media is a really great place to look at it. And also, you would get opinions from all over the world, not just from the country that it's affecting, but you'd get outsider opinions as well. So this allows you to gain some valuable insight into what the general public might think about different topics in real time. Now, using these techniques that I'm going to be talking about in my presentation, you can also learn some new data visualization techniques, primarily through Carmen and libraries in R. And as a fun side project, you could also automate tasks by creating a tweet bot so it could update your status and things like that. And lastly, you can also treat large scale data with very simple tools. Firstly, I'm going to be talking about how you would use uh, API streaming with Tweepy. To begin with, what exactly is an API? So an API stands for an application programming interface. And uh, right now, in the 21st century, we are connected like never before. You can connect between devices and different applications, and we do it at the click of a button. But we don't really think about why this works. So in comes the API. By, I've put in a picture of a definition, but it's not very useful. So to think about an API, it's almost like a messenger. It takes in your requests, gives it to the server, and gives back a response. It's almost like a waiter in a restaurant. When you're trying to order food off of a menu, you need to tell the waiter what you want, and the waiter goes back to the kitchen and comes back with your food. So an API is a really handy waiter. Now, in, um, in real life, when we use, for example, travel agencies or um, you know, when we want to book flights off of a third party website where we compare different websites and different prices, we are interacting with those websites' APIs. So if you want to use, for example, 
um, uh, Trivago to book a hotel. You will look at different prices and they'll give you a list of prices ranging from low to high. And the only reason they can do this is because they can gather data from different uh, hotel websites and aggregate it using the API. Now I'm going to be talking about the REST API, especially with social media. So the REST stands for Representational State Transfer API. And this essentially uses HTTP requests to do some of these things, get, put, post, delete, and a few more things. For example, if you have an API request with a location to the Google Maps API, you could, for example, look at Paris and get GPS, co GPS coordinates for Paris. And from the, those GPS coordinates, you can interact with the Instagram API to get pictures with those locations. Now, while this is fun, I'm going to be talking about Twitter in specific. So how would you interact with the Twitter API? So here, I've written some code that allows you to, maybe you can't read it. OK, so I'll just explain it in a sense. Uh, so Tweepy is an open source library that's really easy to use. And it essentially just asks for your um, access token, an access token secret, a consumer key, and a consumer secret key. And it directly interacts with the Twitter API to allow you to li live stream tweets in real time. So you'd get something like this. So here is just like a list of tweets. And if you update it every day, you'd get um, different amounts of tweets. Now, what the cool thing about Tweepy is that you can also add, for example, language parameters. Here, for example, I've, had, I've added a language EN, which is it'll only get English tweets. You could also add things like track words to search for specific locations or topics. You could add hashtags. You could also look at particular users. And um, you could look at particular accounts. And maybe you can look at a lot of accounts with the same number of followers and things like that. So you could really narrow down your data. The problem with Tweepy, however, is that it really cannot go back in time. The Twitter API only allows you to go back to up to seven days. So if you wanted to talk about data in maybe March 2013, you can't, because Twitter doesn't allow you to do that. However, there are other APIs, such as Get All Tweets, which allows you to interact with older Twitter data, because Twitter data is saved from about, I think, March 2009. So you can really interact and get a lot of information that might be useful to you. Now, once you have this data, maybe you want to look at its location. Tweepy allows you to do that. However, not all tweets are geolocated themselves. So by default, Twitter doesn't, doesn't set up a location for your tweets. So there are no GPS coordinates saved for your tweets at any given time, unless you choose to do so. However, most people don't really notice this and don't add that kind of data. So we don't generally have location data for a lot of tweets. However, if you use Carmen, you can actually get a pretty accurate estimate. So geolocation itself is, uh, well, when you take a picture, you have certain data that comes with the picture. And geolocation is one of them, which is just the GPS coordinates. Now, for example, here is Twitter data in its original JSON format, along with some locations. You probably can't see, but it has created at, tweet ID, a country match, a state match, and so on. These matches are done using a dictionary search and, uh, search and mapping method in Carmen. So Carmen itself is a library that aggregates a lot of information with different spellings and different abbreviations of uh, a lot of places, so you can quite accurately match, uh, for example, NY to New York, New York with different um, case sensitivity to, again, New York. So you can get a pretty good estimate of where your tweets are coming from. In order to reliably use Carmen, you need to kind of see how accurate it is and at what level. So I, have, uh, I streamed about 9,708 tweets with geotags in it. So these are tweets that were already pre-located with the Twitter data. And then I stripped, uh, stripped them off of, this, uh, off of this geotag so that I could use Carmen and compare. Now we can see that there are varying, varying levels of accuracy. At uh, the state level, we have 82%. At the county level, 30.15%. And at the city level, 18.33%. We see that, that the state level is quite accurate and reliable. However, at the city level, not so much. There are also two distance errors. So from, um, from any tweet, since it's in a JSON uh, format, it'll have different attributes. 
and one of these attributes is the latitude and longitude information. So you could calculate a Euclidean distance, which would be just straight across, or a Haversine distance, which would be a curved distance, which is what's more accurate on when you're talking about things like the Earth. However, when you look at the distribution of these errors using Kármán, you see that there's a peak at towards very close to zero, and the graph goes to about 15,000, and you see that most of the tweets are quite accurately geolocated. If you zoom into the graph, uh, you can see that about most of the tweets are less than, well, 100, um, 100 kilometers with error. So essentially, we can conclude that Kármán itself is a very good geolocation tool. And we can reliably use this for um, state and even county data. When, when we were talking about matching, here it means that it's exact matches. So if you talk about New Jersey and New York, which the two, uh, there might be two cities in New Jersey and New York that are about five kilometers apart, even though Kármán quite accurately gets it to that level, it'll be wrong at the city level because well, it is a different city. So here it's very strict with the matching, and it really looks at exact matches between um, the names. Next, once you have all this data and you have it geolocated, so you have its location, you have different attributes for these tweets, maybe you would want to represent this data in a certain way. So here we can create some new, really nice maps using R. So some of the libraries that I used was uh, ggplot2, and uh, chloropeth R. So the cool thing about ggplot is that you can add layers as you go on. So for example, once you have set up, uh, okay, you can't see that either, but once you've set up uh, a CSV file so that you can uh, use the chloropeth library, you can add different layers using ggplot. So you can add uh, a layer for maybe a background image, you can add a layer for um, you know, a compass, you can add labels, you can do a lot of cool things. So for example, here is a map you can create for um, state concentration. This graph in particular shows the Twitter usage in the United States between um, two, any, two arbitrary dates. And here you, we have data with the number of users going from up to 2 to 267. Here you can zoom in a little bit more and look at the county level. I streamed about 6,000 tweets, so there are not that many. But when, once you have like really large data sets, about a million or two million tweets, you'd have a very complete graph. Now you can also look at the city level. And here, with the layers that I added using ggplot, you can see that I've, ha I've added some uh, circles with varying radiuses so that you can see how large or how small the Twitter concentration is. Even you can layer with different transparency levels, different colors, and things like that. And lastly, I'm going to be talking about some introductory language processing. And uh, so I'll go through three things. The kind of language processing tools that are available, what you might want to do with this data, and how you can represent this data using text blob. OK, so there are lots of different things you can do with uh, language processing. These include machine translation, spell checking, chatbots, ad matching, sentiment analysis, speech recognition, and keyword search, out amongst a lot of others. The thing I'm going to be focusing on is sentiment analysis. So using text block, you can create a pretty, pretty good sentiment analyzer for tweets. So here, I'm going to be using the naive base classifier within the text block. And here, I've had some data, which is a little bit cut off, but essentially I've given some very simple phrases like the sandwich is from heaven is positive, this is an amazing place is positive, great night out is positive, and similar things for negative data. And uh, when applying this to some tweets, I localized it to New York. And you can see, for example, the last tweet is President Donald Trump entered the, a entered the arena at UFC 244 in New York to a mix of booze and cheering. There's certainly a lot more. This is attributed to a negative sentiment. The first one, I was used by the New York Times and the US Democratic Party, is in life, uh, is in life grand. This, while it's negative, it's showing up as a positive statement. So clearly, there are some gaps within, um, within this sentiment analyzer. But one really cool thing is that it works with languages apart from English as well. For example, there's a tweet in Thai, 
uh, about the Bangkok, Bangkok Post, and it attributes it to a positive statement. There's also a tweet in Hungarian, uh, and it's about the two before the last one, and it's attributing it to a negative statement. And now some of the future work that I'm going to do and uh, other things I'm involved in. So as um, similar to the speaker before, I am very much interested in inclusivity of uh, tech. So I'm working with Gold Club and Girls in Tech to teach a lot of um, middle school and high school girls in Paris uh, different technologies using JavaScript and uh, Python, primarily to create uh, simple games. I'm also working with the Raspberry Pi Foundation as a translator to translate a lot of their work from English to Hindi, which is a language that I speak fluently. So it makes these coding projects which are very simple and easy to do accessible to a lot more kids around the world. I also work with women in machine learning and data science to uh, present some of my work and also meet other people in the industry. And lastly, I contribute to open source projects such as Mapbox. And uh, right now I'm trying to work with uh, Lina Gora, which is a company based in Paris that works with, um, that creates open source technologies for, uh, for something like Google Home and Alexa, so uh, a voice assistant. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I would entertain them now. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, okay, sorry. Yes? So you just Yes, so the last part when I talked about a sentiment analyzer, it does take some training data and associate a negative or a positive statement to uh, also a neutral statement. For now, I gave a negative and positive. Um, but you could extend this analysis to a lot more um, attributes which you, could, uh, which you could assign using different training data. So the kind of data I gave, I assigned positive and negative, but you could assign, for example, angry, ecstatic, uh, exceptional, you know, sad, a lot of different things with, um, with your training data to create that kind of analysis as well. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the first question was, um, uh, with the language processing, am I only assigning it to negative or positive statements? And the next question is, is there any library um, for use doing language processing? So one library that I know of is NLP Allen, which is uh, an open source library. And um, they allow you to do a lot of different natural language processing tasks. So this could be, training your own neural network to um, assign data. It could also be to create maps, um, to create graphs about your data to have, uh, for example, multi-dimensional visualizations. So you could have, for example, uh, a cluster of data for happy, a cluster of data for sad, another cluster for angry. You see, so you could have multi-dimensional representations of this kind of data. Anything else? Okay, any other questions? No, yeah, okay. Yep, thank you.